It's good to gather into the house of the Lord to worship the Lord, isn't it? Just a couple of items before, uh, before we go to God's word. I just want to say thank you to Mrs. Honus. That, just, that was just a great children's story to lead into our message today. And Elder Honus, welcome back. If you'll come here just for a moment, just, just for a moment, give us the condensed, condensed, welcome to October 15, our West Region Training Day. The condensed, condensed. He knows I can talk forever. Um, so the condensed... We are cut of the same cloth. <laughs> we are, the condensed, condensed is that on October 15, there are two locations starting at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Well, you can check the exact schedules in your bulletin probably. But 2 p.m. in the afternoon. One is Lancaster, which is just up the road from you. I know nobody likes to drive, but that's not a bad drive. And then you have equidistant to another great location, Simi Valley. We have rooms reserved in both locations, and we have three seminars taking place all duplicated in both locations. So if you go to one location, you're going to get everything everybody else is going to get. And we're focusing on greeting. We're focusing on... Um, John Cress's thank discipleship. Thank you, John Cress is doing discipleship. And then we're focusing on, on uh, vision and change and what it means to have a church culture, basically, uh, collectively and then in our, individually church, our churches individually. And if we have a culture, is our culture such that it is conducive or open to welcoming new people, uh, evangelizing our communities and reaching the needs around us. And so those are gonna be some of the topics explored. Uh, John and Karen Kress come to us from Potomac Conference. He's our new secretary and ministerial director and Karen is doing strategic planning with our uh, conference as a whole. And then we have Rich Litke coming from uh, Oregon to do a master greeter seminar again. So I, if I remember correctly, there were was it there were at least Peter two you don't have to be at that one they, there were at least <laughs> there were at least two <laughs> there were at least two groups uh, that I have a special invitation if I remember correctly that would be the greeters the greeters have a special invitation uh, nominating committees that would be in, responsible for knowing what these different ministries are elders church boards uh, you have a very important role to play in the culture of your church and anybody engaged in discipleship, which could be anything from children's ministries uh, on through um, Sabbath school teaching and so forth. So we want to uh, offer training to any and everyone who wants to be there. You're all welcome, but we, we particularly want to focus on greeters and our leadership teams. So that was one group. Now, if they're not board member or something like that, they're part of the other group. Right. That should be there and, and share in receiving the blessings that have been arranged for them. Correct. So it's Thank very short notice, a couple weeks, but we hope to see you in either Simi Valley or Lancaster. I will not be both places at once. I try, but it just hasn't worked out. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, just mention a special thank you to our volunteers that work behind the scenes in our church. We have about 30 or 40 that have been active this week, um, helping with Family Promise. Thank you so much. That helps the extend that reaches into the community to help families that um, are without housing. We house them for a week, then they go on. Also, some of you may know um, or may not know, one of our members uh, is a treasurer at Glendale Adventist Academy, doing an excellent job. So he represents our church uh, in a formal way and in an informal way. I had the pleasure of being in, uh, let's see, where was it, Ojai? Palmdale and Glendale this week um, in different capacities representing the church and being here in, in our own um, in our own community. It's an amazing thing when God has asked us to participate with him in sharing his wonderful goodness and grace, isn't it? Let's pray together. Father, as we go to your word this morning, Lord, we open our hearts to you. Father, speak to us from the sacred pages of your scripture. May these be more 
than ink on paper. May they be words from on high, the breath of your spirit that will live in our hearts. So, Father, bless us, we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. It was just a few years ago, so it seems, at least in my memory, almost like yesterday. I had some place to go. I was physically in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and my heart was in Fargo, Oklahoma. Now that's a short distance when you're a few years younger, somewhere around 500 miles, give or take. And the plan was, long before GPS and cell phones, to pull out what it was commonly known as a Rand McNally address, uh, address, Rand McNally atlas, the map, and look at the, the quickest direction was across the southwest corner of Minnesota, slipping a little bit through uh, Dakota and Oklahoma and down, uh, Nebraska and down into Oklahoma. So the plan was well thought out. The gas tank was filled for under $10. Car was running fine. It's amazing what a pair of pliers and a screwdriver on a carburetor can do, a draw meter and a timing light. It was running nice. The 250 under the hood and the three speed on the column with the four barrel carburetor would take me down the road just fine. As, the, as I put the key in the Camaro, I was on my way. Leaving at nine o'clock at night, there shouldn't be much traffic. Should be able to make good, good time. Not too many highway patrol out, hopefully. 65, 70 miles an hour, maybe a little faster. When you, you know, in the middle of the night, it, nobody's on the road. You can take care of a lot of ground quickly. Everything was running fine. Plan was intact, should arrive at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. People should be awake and a phone call on the other end should give me final directions to my destination. Somewhere, I don't recall exactly where, the sky lit up with lightning, darkness and lightning alternating. And at first, the lightning strikes were further off across the a.m. radio, no FM in those days. Across the AM radio were storm warnings from this line to this line. Well, I wasn't a local, a local be able, being able to determine from the two points. I just knew there was a, a lot of intense lightning. Now, living in California, when I say a lot of intense lightning, you have no idea what lightning is, hardly let alone intense lightning. Intense lightning might be something like this. Go into your living room on a dark night. Pull the curtains so it's totally dark. Take your camera strobe light. Put it four feet from in front of your face and have your spouse click it about every five or ten seconds for five to ten minutes, you will understand what intense lightning is all about. I wasn't too concerned. I was in a vehicle and I don't recall anybody dying from lightning because of the insulation factor. But off in the distance could be seen a couple of funnel clouds. The storms were right upon me. And I just said, Lord, I've got some place to go. And I thought I, I thought I, I thought he was smiling when I was telling him that. He already knew. I was on a mission, and nothing was going to slow me down. Not lightning, not funnel clouds. I was going somewhere. I was here, but my heart was someplace else. And so you know the end of the story, I'm here today yet. Having arrived safely somewhere after 
7.30 in the morning, I picked up the phone somewhere in Fargo, Oklahoma. You can find it on the map today yet. You can go through it in about uh, 14 seconds. I think there's an elementary school, a post office, and a half a dozen homes that I counted. And uh, you can quickly sail through. I did find the single, uh, the single pay phone. Some of you don't know what those are. Put in enough to get final landing directions and shortly thereafter connected with my now wife, Karen, to meet at her grandparents' house some 10 or 11 hours later. It was a short drive. Okay, guys, what's been your longest drive to see your date? A couple hundred miles, cross town, cross states. Today we go long distances when, when hearts and matters are loved love are involved. Storms. Storms come into our lives. They come quickly. They come unexpectedly. And they don't always end well. And you may be having, uh, your week this week may be on even keel. So this is a message that you may want to footnote. So that when the storm comes, you'll be able to say, oh yes, I have a reference. I know where I need to go. I know where I need to turn. Storms come in many different fashions. It might come with a warning that the plant is being shut down. All of a sudden, your life is turned upside down. Because you live paycheck to paycheck. You live bills 30 days, 60 days due already. It's 2 a.m., and your 16-year-old son isn't home yet. You're afraid he's out drinking. And your husband pops open another beer and says, don't worry about it, dear. Storms come unexpectedly. You're sitting in a doctor's office with your four-year-old child, not knowing what the diagnosis will be. And the doctor comes in and says, there is no cure will do the best we can. Storms come when you're informed you didn't pass a key class in your ongoing studies and you'll have to do some remedial work. Storms come when your neighbor earlier in life molested you and you carry that with you. Storms come when you hate who you are and you don't know how to resolve it. Storms come when it feels like no one loves you. And in the midst of believing, and in the midst of what is normally a pretty even keel, Storms on the horizon come. And so while we look at this old, old story, we can glean some lessons from it. So the question of the day is, where is your anchor in life? Where is your anchor? You can ask that question. For many of us, it's in our families. For some of us, it's in the security of a good job, a house, the things that we've acquired, and a path going forward that we are just sure about that nothing's going to change. So I ask you again, where is your anchor today? You see, from our scripture reading today, we will, uh, we will look at the life of Paul. Paul went from being a Jew and persecuting Christians to being a Christian, to be persecuted by those 
who he, those who were persecuting him. Kind of a full circle piece, isn't it? Persecuting Christians to becoming a Christian, loving Christ, only to be persecuted and taken captive. And he finds himself amidst the storm of being transported to Rome and on board ship. And on, on, on his way, you heard the story in the children's story in summary. On his way, Paul began to admonish the men in Acts 27, verse 9 and 10. He began to admonish them and say to them, Men, I perceive that this voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of cargo and ship, but also will not only of great cargo and ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than he was by being said what Paul was saying, because the harbor was not suitable for wintering. They pressed on unwisely. Now, the ships of yesteryear were not like the cruise ships of today. 270 or so souls on board that ship. The ship, uh, the ship sailed, and they let down their anchors in verse 17 along the way. And the violent storm came up in verse 18, and they began to jettison cargo. And on the third day, the ship's tackle was thrown overboard with their own hands. And verse 20 says, As a, no small storm was assailing us from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Do you catch the intensity? Imagine yourself. Go back with me in your mind's eye. Three days into the storm, the Scripture records they abandoned how much hope? All hope. All hope was gone. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to this, through those situations in life? where you wonder, how am I going to get out of this situation? Where do I turn? Everything is falling apart. I don't know what to do. So where is your anchor in your time of need, I might ask? So let's look and let's see what Scripture provides for us to be anchors in our life. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 and 19 is a passage of Scripture that you probably know very well. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Did you get that? Where is your anchor? Our anchor is in Christ alone. Verse 19 says, We have an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters in within the veil. Our hope is not a hope that we have put together that is dependent upon something in our life here on earth. Our hope is our intermediate, intermediary Christ alone in the sanctuary at this time. I'm so glad that our hope looks up. Aren't you, friends? I'm so glad. There's an old, old song. Um, I have friends, the, the, the old country western says, I have friends in low places. You finished it for me, didn't you? I'm, friend, I'm glad, friends, that I have a friend in high places, aren't you? My faith doesn't look down for answers. My faith looks up for answers. My faith is not looking for hope around me. My faith is looking to Christ alone, our source of hope that is both sure and steadfast. Can you say amen? amen? 
Do you have good news today? When all things look the darkest, we come to Christ alone. Back to Acts chapter 27, verse 21. Men you ought to have followed my, avoid, uh, my advice, and not to set sail from Crete and incur this damage and loss. Now I urge you to keep your courage up. There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night the angel of the Lord God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid. I like those words, don't you? We relish in them because we've heard them so many times. But when the pressures come, when hope gives way to hopelessness, often in the darkness, that's we can't see beyond that. But the Spirit of God says, do not be afraid because Christ is your hope. And he is steadfast, and he is sure, and whatever you're facing is temporal, and he will see you through. Do you believe it, friends? You ought to underline, if, if you don't underline in your Bibles, you start right now. Hebrews chapter 6, 19 and 20. Underline it in red, underline it in yellow, star it in the margin. Put a sticky note on it. Put it in the back of your Bible. Put it in the front of your Bible. And when things are not going well, you just go back to that anchor because it is sure. The second lesson we learn from Acts is Acts chapter 27, verse 23, that he is present. He is present just as he was present with Paul on the ship that night, he is present in our lives. For Hebrews says, Hebrews 13, 5 says, let your conversation and behavior be without covetousness and be content with such things as you, as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor what? Forsake thee. I will be present in your life 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I will never leave thee or forsake thee. That promise is not contingent upon how we feel, right? That promise is sure because it comes from the word of God in Christ himself. Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you sometimes, even unto the end. No, 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 no. I am with you always. Which part of difficulties in life do we have trouble with? Is there any place you can go? Is there any situation that you remove yourself from where Christ is? I am with you always, always, always. From your good times to your bad times, from your most desperate times to the places where things or times going well. Christ's presence is with us is a lesson that we learn from the life of Paul and the shipwreck experience. God keeps his promises just as he did with Paul. Fearing that they might um, cast themselves upon the rock, they put out four anchors. And the anchors held for a short while. And they finally said, we must abandon ship. They threw all their cargo Let's, uh, let's have some, uh, a meal. And they threw all the wheat overboard, and everything went overboard. And what you, do, you may not know is that all of the prisoners on board had their right hand shackled to the left hand of a guard and a chain in between. And the penalty for the guard, if the prisoner did, arri did not arrive at his destination, would be the death of the guard. As the ship was taking on water, they, they took, <clears throat> excuse me, they took the, the lifeboat and put it alongside of the ship. Paul said, no, nope, that's not what God wants you to do. If you do that, everybody on board will perish. Knowing he was a man of God, they, they cut the ropes to the lifeboat. They cut the ropes to the anchors. 
and there were floating. And the, the ship began to take on water. And they had a choice to make. Now, if you were a prisoner, it's not looking good for you at this point in time, is it? It's not looking good. Because the Roman law was, you execute the prisoner before they can get away. You execute them, unlock the shackle, and it's every man for himself. As the water was rising on the ship. One of the crew, Julius was his name, went to the centurions and said, let all of your prisoners unshackle all of your prisoners, that they too might live. Now that took an element of faith for those who were centurions. They unshackled the prisoners. Everybody went overboard. Everything was thrown into the sea. And you know the story as well as I do. They all made it to land safely. What a miracle. What a happy ending. End of story. Or is it so? One of the lessons from this story is that, an additional lesson, is that God keeps his promises. His promises are sure. Paul writes in being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he was and continues to be able to what? Perform. His promises are sure. God's anchor is down. For with God, nothing is impossible. Deliverance is ours as we turn to him. There is a difference, though, between hope and just optimism. Because optimism works something like this. Sailors, in particular, and fisher, uh, people who love fishing are very optimistic. Uh, when you go fishing, you drop that line in the water and you wait two, three hours for a nibble. If it's a good day, you get one or two or three or six or ten and you take them home. So one neighbor was asking another neighbor and said, well, how's the fishing going? He said, better. Well, tell me about it. So he very optimistically told him the story. Two weeks ago, I went fishing for four hours and I didn't catch anything. It was a good day fishing, though, because I was fishing. But this week, it's better. It only took me three hours to catch nothing. But he was being very optimistic. For you see, sometimes human beings and Christians are like that. Well, how's it going? I'm just Mr. Optimistic. Let me tell you how optimistic I am. I bought three lottery tickets, and I'm sure that they're going to be calling my number. Or I put $27 down on eight black, and I just know it's coming through. Or Lucky Harry in the fourth is sure to pay up this week. And I know because $8 went into the offering, God's going to bless me. Optimism is good, but godly, opti godly hope is better. For optimism is just of this earth. Our hope is not of this earth. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is that whatever comes our way, Christ is right there. Nothing can take us away from Him except we are self. So let me ask you, where is your hope today? So one final concluding thought. I googled, of all things, anchors, because I like to get a little trivia. 
The largest anchor that is under production now is 17 tons, 17 tons, okay? So that's somewhere around 35,000 pounds. Now visually, if you can imagine in your mind's eye for just a minute, there was a coil, a chain that was going to carry or let down that anchor in particular. And a man was standing in the coil. He looked like an ant in a regular coil of, of a swing set chain. Because each link, the link in the chain, just the link, weighed 500 pounds. Now, if I'm going to have an anchor, that's an anchor I want. How about you, friends? 35,000 pounds down in the in the sea of the ocean, anchored, and there I am, safe and secure. Let the wind and the waves roll in. I am anchored. I got some real bad news. If that's where your anchor is, you're in trouble. Because of all the anchors that have gone down into the sea, they'll all rust away. They'll all melt away. They won't hold when the pressure's on. They won't be with you in the loneliness of night. They won't be with you when it's just you and quietness. They won't be with you when you have just a couple of minutes to decide between right and wrong. They won't be with you when you need them the most because you're looking down. Our anchor causes us to look up. Our anchor takes us heavenward. Our anchor takes us into the throne room of God. Our anchor anchors our hope in Christ alone. May we go from, forth from this place, placing our lives and our hope in Christ alone.